Now, uh, I really just wrapped up last time with this discussion of aliasing by um, giving you these, uh, I hope, pretty well known um, relationships for um, uh, expressing the the, um, the Nyquist uh, uh, criterion. So your the maximum frequency that you can have in your um, continuous data before sampling uh, is one over two times the um, the time sample interval, and that's a uh, uh, that's a pretty hard limit. Um, very difficult to uh, get past that, and it means that that you can do nothing with the data. Um, uh, digitally, you know, in a computer, um, if your uh, uh, if your delta t does not fit the maximum frequency content. Um, now, of course, when we when we digitize data in seismometers or or in the field, this is um, you know we know there's energy up above you know whatever f max that we that we might have, um, and we would like to believe, though, that it's small, and that the energy we're looking for, the energy that um, that dominates the spectrum of the uh, of the data, uh, we'd like to believe that that energy is is you know um, fifty or a hundred decibels you know greater in, in amplitude. All right, so. Uh, um, you know, this is really a statement about the uh, um, uh, the the data as it exists in the physical world, and uh, even you know, uh, it's it's even though it's extremely expensive and not done hardly at all anymore, um, the only way to uh, to get rid of uh, of that high frequency energy is to apply a um, you know, a, a filtering circuit that filters the data in the uh, uh, you know as a continuous electrical signal. Um, you can't do anything with it um, uh, if uh, uh, if you've already digitized the data. And then here's the criterion on the uh, wavelength, um, and you can see this is easily translated. You know, if you it would be a wavelength if you're sampling in space, so this would be the the minimum wavelength would be two times delta x if you're sampling in space, and we'll deal with that more explicitly in um, uh, in the second half of the class. All right, so you know, subject to our Nyquist criterion and these problems that we can get with aliasing, uh, now we're going to talk. The rest of the class, at least the rest of this part of the class, about what you can do with uh, uh, with the Fourier transform and sampled data. Okay, so uh, we have looked at the Fourier transform. We've realized that if we give a particular definition to z, that that doing a z transform can actually be doing a um, a Fourier transform. Okay, so uh, now you know really our fully fr our fully transformed data are both in the z transform domain and the uh, um, and the the Fourier transform domain in the frequency domain. Okay, so let's look at the uh, the definition of of some familiar things such as the spectrum uh, from. Z transforms from Fourier transforms. Okay, uh, we've seen the definition of the the spectrum uh, according to um, uh, Clairbout, uh, and this is a capital S. That's why it's got those little ears on it. Uh, we've seen that as the um, um, as the power spectrum, which is the the square um, of the uh, um, of the magnitude. Okay, that that's what these. These absolute value bars mean they really mean the magnitude of the Fourier transform of S. So x x is the I'm sorry x is the Fourier transform of the 
little x time series, okay, and um, uh, and we take the uh, and that's complex, of course. The Fourier transform yields a complex number, so then we can take its magnitude and square it, uh, and and you know there's a different number a component at each frequency value omega, and uh, when, when we square it, then we have what we call the spectrum. And you probably uh, know also that to get the square of the magnitude of a complex number, you simply take the complex number and you multiply it by its, its uh, complex conjugate, which is what the bar over the, the x means. Okay? So it's, I'll say, x conjugate of omega times x of omega is equal to the spectrum. So uh, here's, a, a, for a, uh, here's a, a simple time series, three elements long. Uh, the x time series has x at zero time, x at delta t, x at two delta t, um, and then we've transformed it into the uh, z domain and then into the Fourier domain. Right? We take uh, um, uh, well, as you can see, I've taken uh, delta t equal to uh, one, um, which is Clairaut's usual trick, and so uh, you know z is e to the i omega delta. T and here it's just e to the i omega, right? There's z squared, e to the i times two omega, okay? And so um, uh, now we see the Fourier transform of this three-element time series is x zero plus x one times e to the i omega plus x two times e to the i two omega, okay? Very simple. Now to get the spectrum, we take uh, x conjugate and to make the uh, conjugate of of uh, you know this um, um, complex uh, polynomial, all we have to do is uh, take the conjugate of each uh, 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 each of the terms of the polynomial, right? So we have the conjugate of x zero plus uh, x one conjugate times e to the minus i omega, right? That's the complex conjugate of e to the i omega uh, plus uh, x two conjugate times e to the minus i two omega, right? Again, complex conjugate. And then there's just uh, x of omega again, okay. And um, uh, then we realize, oh, um, you know, we can take this back into uh, 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 z, right? Um, and we have, uh, um, you know, e to the minus i omega. Well, what does what does that mean? That's actually one over z, okay. E to the minus two i uh, omega. Uh, is one over z squared, right? Uh, so here we have um, uh, x zero plus uh, uh, I mean so, I'm sorry x one x zero conjugate plus x one conjugate over z plus x two conjugate over z squared, and then we have uh, zero plus x one z plus x two times z, and that's supposed to be a squared there. Uh, sorry about that. Why is uh, it z squared? Because there's a two. It's two omega. In the top. Yeah, because z is is e to the i omega, right? Mm -hmm. Delta t is one, uh, and so e to the i two omega is two z. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, z squared. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what what have we got here? Well, you know, this is clearly the z transform of x. So that's x of z. What is this? That's uh, that's the z transform of x conjugate. Okay, but uh, um, instead of it's, it's the z transform. Instead of using z, we use one over z, and so now we see very clearly that the the conjugate of x uh, uh, of z, big X of z, is big X conjugate of one over z. So so as you might expect, one over z is the conjugate of z. And so here's you know in the spectrum has taught us now uh, how to you know what the complex conjugate of z is, um, and so we're going to be looking at a lot of these uh, uh, series where uh, we're using z to the minus one power z inverse instead of z, but this is still a z polynomial here, um, you know still a still a polynomial of z right I mean if you Wanted to clear this uh, out, you'd have to multiply. You'd have to multiply it out, then multiply every term by z squared, right? And then you could clear it out into a z polynomial, 
and that would be the spectrum. You know, okay. So let's do that, right? So uh, we got uh, x conj x two conjugate x zero over z squared. Again, I left out a square, thanks to my former my my previous classes for pointing this out somewhere along the line. Uh, x one conjugate x zero plus x two conjugate x one over z plus um, uh, x0 conjugate x0 plus x1 conjugate x1 plus x2 conjugate x2 plus, uh, times z to the zeroth power, just a 1 there, uh, and then uh, x0 conjugate x1 plus x1 conjugate x2 all times z, right, plus uh, x0 conjugate x2 um, times z squared, okay, and so now I want to write down, all right, this is uh, the spectrum uh, uh, of x in, uh, in, the, in z as a z polynomial. And so apparently now what I've got here is a, um, you know, I, 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 I can um, uh, collect all these together. So, so here's, you know, there's 1 over z squared, 1 over z squared. Here's the 1 over z term, the 1 over z term. Um, and, and x2 conjugate x0, I'm gonna, that product I'm going to call the uh, spectrum at uh, minus 2 times delta, uh, uh, delta t. Um, yeah, minus 2 times delta t. Um, and um, uh, and then there's the uh, the spectral component at uh, minus one times delta t. The spectral component at zero. Um, the spectral component at uh, uh, you know these are still time samples in here, right? And uh, and if we just substitute in you know z equals e to the i omega, then uh, then we'll have it in terms of frequency as well. And again, uh, that's the z squared there. Um, so uh, uh, now you can see how you get, um, you know, how do you how do you get these spectral components? Uh, well, this summation, uh, I mean, I pulled out of a hat, but uh, you know, you could you could uh, you could you could do it by inspection, looking at these, and uh, and come up with this uh, this summation. Um, so the spectral component. At uh, at lag k at time k, which I'll call a lag for reasons that'll become apparent. Spectral time co component at, at time index k is equal to the sum over all time n of x at time n conjugate times x at time n plus k. Now, now uh, when we looked at the uh, at the summation that gives us the convolution, right? The the one we were summing over was was subtracted in in the indices. You know, it was like k minus n, right? But that's not true here. It's just added. Okay. So what that means is that is that we're doing the same kind of operation, um, and I think that's way back in the other. Uh, um, that's that's way back in the other uh, um, uh, presentation uh, number two. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna flip back to that. Uh, but if you remember that, um, that that meant that as we were sliding the time series by each other, um, we were um, we had to flip one around to do convolution. But since uh, n here is is positive in the uh, um, you know, it's just n plus k, and k is the lag time. You know, they're they're both time series. You know, this is the time series basically being dot producted with itself and and always in order. So it's not a convolution. This actually will turn out to be called an autocorrelation. It's a you know, if you take the the successive dot products with different overlaps or at different lags, um, that's a that's a correlation or cross correlation. And uh, since we're essentially dot producting um, x with itself, it's called an autocorrelation. All right, an autocorrelation is one you know. And this in this summation here, it's done in your cell phone, it's done in a vibrosized seismic survey, 
It's done in your GPS receiver. Uh, it's done in. Uh, um, it's done to um, uh, find um, uh, empirical Green's functions with, uh, say, day-long seismograms. Um, it's done to uh, uh, to, uh, to to get high precision uh, earthquake arrival times. Um, uh, this this I, I would say at this point, uh, uh, twenty years ago, I would have said that uh, convolution is is the most powerful um, tool we have in um, you know convolution and filtering is the most powerful tool we have in geophysical signal analysis. Now, 20 years later, I would certainly say that autocorrelation has proved, autocorrelation, cross-correlation have proved to be, you know, the most powerful um, signal, uh, signal processing methods. Uh, the applications are so wide, and they brought about such incredible, um, uh, you know, really such incredible uh, innovations in the last. Ten years, even, uh, and it's all um, it's all based on on you know this this spectrum actually, uh, and and that's kind of interesting. Now you see that the the spectrum is related very closely to this autocorrelation, um, you know, through the uh, Z transform here. Um, now one thing uh, you know inspect. If you inspect these, uh, um, this this formula here for S of of the spectrum of a of a three element time series, it's got one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's got five uh, elements, non-zero elements. Three element time series got five non-zero elements, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, um, and um, notice that that the uh, you know, at time minus two, it's x two conjugate x zero, and at time plus two, it's x zero conjugate x two. Now, if the the time series was complex, then these would not be, you know, these would not be the same. You know, complex multiplication does not commute. You can't just reverse the order or take the con the complex conjugate of the other thing, and get the same answer. Okay, but of course, as you can see, if 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 x zero, if all the samples of x are real, as as our data are always real, okay, then then you know x two conjugate x zero is exactly the same number as x zero conjugate x two. You know, obviously the same number because you know multiplication of real numbers does commute. Uh, and it doesn't matter which one you take the conjugate of, because the, con the complex conjugate has no effect on a real number. So uh, uh, what is that telling us? Uh, you know, right from this formula here, it says that that the spectrum at positive time k is equal to the spectrum at negative time k. So the spectrum is symmetric. It's one of these symmetric functions. Okay. You know, looks like a cosine, symmetric about zero time, uh, and also autocorrelations of real data are symmetric. Um, um, so that's another uh, uh, another another good uh, uh, good lesson. Uh, you know, these are not anti-symmetric; they're they're symmetric. Okay. Now, uh, um, what what else uh, can we see in this simple uh, this simple spectrum? Okay. Um, so we have all right. So so let's acknowledge the symmetric the symmetry, and so from that three element time series, its spectra its spectrum as a as a Z transform. Only has three components, right? Because uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. You know, this S one is. It's you know that's that's the same at um, um, 
at uh, uh, minus time minus 1 and time plus 1. So really, we have s1 times z plus 1 over z, right? That's, that's just boiling this down, right? Just combining the terms that are, uh, that are equal. And we have s2 times uh, z squared plus 1 over z squared. Right now, using z, you know, in the algebra. Uh, all right, so now let's let's finish, you know, the conversion to uh, 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 to a spectrum in, in frequency in the frequency domain, and let's get the spectrum of the z transform of um, um, of the uh, of x in the omega domain. So we're going to substitute here. For instead of just z, we're going to say, okay, this is we're going to put in z of omega, right? So instead of z, we have uh, e to the i omega. One over z, of course, is just e to the minus i omega. And here's uh, z squared and one over z squared. All right. Uh, and and then uh, we um, we simply uh, uh, combine these. Um, you know, you can you can write them out. You know. Uh, e to the i omega is uh, cosine omega plus i sine omega. Um, e to the uh, minus i omega is cosine omega minus i sine omega. Right. So, so th actually, the imaginary term is going to drop out. Okay. You know, write that out yourself if you're not, if 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 it's not obvious to you. The imaginary term is going to drop out, and we we're left with s zero. Plus two s one times cosine omega plus two s two uh, times cosine two omega. All right, and and you can write a, a general uh, just like this. You can you can write a general um, uh, summation to give you these uh, coefficients, right? Um, and uh, what we've got is. Uh, uh, sum over uh, s of omega is a sum over all frequencies k, and and obviously here I'm assuming that there's some, you know, we have discretized and sampled the frequency. Uh, you can assume here that I sampled frequency at uh, uh, evenly at at some constant delta omega, okay, um, and we will we'll talk more about that later, uh, but just you know reducing that to uh, to sampled frequency um, quickly. We have the, the component s sub k, right? Which is which is you know we get via the autocorrelation, right? So the autocorrelation at leg time k um, times uh, cosine uh, of k times omega, okay? And, and this might look rather familiar now. Remember the the formula for a uh, a discrete Fourier transform. You know, this was the cosine part that works on the real, you know, s the the spectrum, uh, the spectral component s of k, you know, being an autocorrelation of a of a real of real data, uh, uh, and I by that I mean you know not complex data but real data. Uh, it's um, uh, it's a real number, so s of k is a real number, and and so the only thing in here is a cosine transform the. You know, there's no imaginary part to this uh, spectrum. The spectrum is all real, and it's just the cosine transform of the autocorrelation. Okay. So, for a real signal, the cosine transform of the autocorrelation equals the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform. Okay, and 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 what this uh, essentially means. Is is that um, you can get to the same result? You can get to the spectrum uh, in either of two ways. Okay, you can uh, um, you can take the you can Fourier transform your your data and take its magnitude uh, squared, uh, and you get a spectrum that way. You can also do a you can you can autocorrelate your signal. And and then if you just take its cosine transform, you have the same spectrum, mathematically the same. Okay, um, and and that's why um, that's why I've been asserting, for instance, uh, and and it's going to take us a while to see this all the way. 
Um, I've been asserting that, uh, for instance, my Remy results, which are presented as power spectra or power spectral ratios, okay, um, they're they're computed using using uh, you know they're they're a spectrum that's computed using the Fourier transform, and that's just another path to exactly the same thing as if I had taken my microtremor noise data, and I had applied a cross-correlation to get empirical Green's functions, you know, say comparing, uh, you know, one, uh, uh, one geophone to another down the, down the array of geophones in a Remy array, um, and, um, uh, and, and then uh, uh, transform that, okay? So, so actually, uh, uh, at least theoretically, Okay. Anything you can do with empirical Green's functions by cross correlation, you could do by taking their spectrum with a Fourier transform, because the Fourier transform is is in essence a cross correlation, or they're just two different routes to the same thing. Okay. Um, now, now this you know now correlations are are quite difficult. Um, and well, they're time consuming. Uh, uh, you know, at the SCEC meeting, we heard some uh, talk about you know using cyber infrastructure resources for for you know cross correlation cross correlating massive databases of seismographs. I mean, that's a it's a hard problem to to take all of the data that that uh, Iris, uh, for instance, is archiving, or even that our our seismic network here is archiving. I mean, we need considerable computing horsepower that actually we don't have just to, uh, you know, calculate all the empirical Green's functions uh, that are implied by our, our um, uh, that are implied by by our um, um, uh, you know by by our network, uh, you know, just by the stations that we're recording continuously. Um, and it's it's a really hard problem. Now now, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not negating uh, these the you know the difficulty of this problem because it does turn out that when you get to dealing with data uh, that has noise, uh, there are some distinct disadvantages to taking the Fourier transform route. Okay, so so you uh, uh, you might not want to. And in fact, the people who who uh, who work the most on empirical Green's functions, um, you know, they they have shown why, at least with with most data sets, you cannot do a Fourier transform. You you have to do the uh, the autocorrelation or cross correlation. Okay, so there seem to be some practical reasons why this theoretical path doesn't work. But uh, you know, I've proved that for Remy data, refraction microtremor data. Uh, you know, which is smaller scale and shorter in time, uh, and is also you know, uh, refraction microtremor data is based on um, on microtremor, which is not so micro. You know, when we when we compute a shear velocity uh, based on the uh, fundamental mode Rayleigh waves, uh, you know, from uh, uh, vibrations induced by cars and and vehicles in the in the street, you know, we're actually we're actually pulling out uh, you know that's those are the most powerful waves in the data, and you can see those uh, you can see those waves you know right in the raw data. Obviously, the uh, uh, the empirical Green's functions are are showing you waves that you cannot see obviously in the data. So uh, that's the reason why uh, I could go the um, uh, for Remy analysis. I could go the uh, uh, the, the very simple Fourier transform spectrum route. Uh, and you can't with uh, empirical Green's functions from from network seismograms. Um, but it it as we'll find out, um, you can save millions, uh, uh, billions uh, of uh, of computer uh, um, clock cycles by by going through the Fourier transform because we will find that there is a there's an easier way to do the Fourier transform. Right now, as far as you know, the Fourier transform is no easier to compute than the uh, than the autocorrelation. 
it takes n squared. You know, if n is the number of samples in your seismogram, it takes n squared operations to give you a Fourier transform. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to find out how much easier it can be, especially with really long time series, to compute the uh, the Fourier transform. We'll we'll develop the fast Fourier transform. Um, and now there's even some you know very fast Fourier transforms. So so Fourier you know Fourier transform technology uh, uh, offers us a, a way out of perhaps you know if we can control some of the problems with noise and uncovering um, you know data that's that's not obvious within our seismograms. The Fourier transform uh, technology you know might offer us some. Uh, uh, some some ways to solve this computing conundrum we have now, uh, you know, we may end up uh, having to transmit all our seismograms to, you know, a big supercomputer center, um, uh, you know, like this one they just established at Wyoming, um, and and uh, you know that may be what we have to plan to do to to be a comprehensive network that produces empirical reads functions for all of its data. Um, on the other hand. Um, you know, we might have to build a, a, a big cluster, build and maintain a big cluster ourselves. You know, that, that could be even more expensive. So, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, we're always on the lookout for for any any you know new idea that would make uh, uh, make this uh, um, this process of uh, generating the empirical reads function uh, more efficient. Because uh, we're going to make we're going to make so many more so many more discoveries, uh, and be able to do so much more analysis from empirical reads functions. You know, it looks it's looking like they're really going to be worth calculating. You know, comprehensively, and that is a right now it's a very tough computational problem. Um, but you know, maybe in this you know on these brief two pages, there's there's some clues about how we can do that more easily. I'm hoping it. Um, okay, we, we're talking about spectra. Let's talk about uh, filters. Remember filters? You know that's that's what we do with uh, um, with uh, uh, convolution. You know, convolution is the process of applying a filter. We have an input x, and we take its z transform. So we have x of z, and if we have a filter time series, um, then uh, we take uh, f of z and multiplying these two z polynomials is the same thing as um, uh, uh, as uh, um, convolving the, the two time series. We get our output y as a z transform by, with the polynomial multiplication. Um, now, if we want to get uh, if we want to get uh, the spectra of y, the spectrum of f, the spectrum of, of x. Okay, um, we got to take the complex conjugate of everything. Okay, well the complex conjugate of y of z is y conjugate of one over z. Complex conjugate of f of z is f conjugate of one over z. The complex conjugate of x of z is x conjugate of one over z. And so, okay, y conjugate y, which we know is the spectrum of the output y, is you know now now you know just putting this in, multiplying this all out. Uh, it's just f conjugate f times x conjugate x, right? Very simple. Okay. Uh, so right away, this tells us a lot about if you if if you've had any, had, had any experience with with filters with I'm sorry with spectra before. Now you know that the output spectrum. Remember these these spectra, these spectral components are you know and these are now if you substitute uh, z in terms of uh, omega, right? You know, this is going to be a real number at some at some uh, uh, frequency omega, right? And here's a real number, and here's a real number. Um, so the output spectrum, which is a, a series of real numbers at different frequencies, is just equal to the filter spectrum times the input spectrum. Okay, and th these are all real numbers, no, nothing even complex anymore. Um, so uh, uh, you know uh, what does filtering do? It it screens, it multiplies the um, the it multiplies spectra. Okay, it doesn't add to spectra, or it doesn't add or subtract spectra. It multiplies them. 
Uh, and now you know we can define since since the output is the product of two spectra. Now we can very easily take a spectral ratio, right? And and this is again just dividing by re, you know dividing a real number out of a real number, right? We take the uh, the spectrum of the output and we divide it by the uh, the spectrum of the input, right? And that spectral ratio, which is done, we just do the division, you know, frequency by frequency, gives us the spectrum of the filter, okay? And we might even call this the characteristic spectrum of the filter f. Okay, so uh, hopefully this is a, a little bit of, of review, but uh, um, you know should uh, um, should give you a, a, a kind of a preview of of a very useful thing, right? I mean, um, you know, let's say we're trying to dev to derive the um, the, you know, let's say F, the filter F, was for, in explosion seismology the um, um, the Earth reflectivity sequence, you know, which would give us the two-way travel time to spikes that are uh, uh, that are e at each interface. Okay, and we want to know those two two-way travel times because then we can calculate the depths of the interfaces. Right? We have our our data, and we we d we have our data spectrum. And we divide by the spectrum of the of the input, you know, maybe the vibra size signal, or the blast uh, time function, and uh, and that would then give us the spectrum of the uh, of the the Earth reflectivity series. Okay, and you can think of lots of of uh, applications for this in earthquake seismology too. This spectral ratioing. Uh, I mean, aside from being used to inspect for uh, amplifications and such, it's also uh, uh, has another name called deconvolution, which you, is a process you may have heard of. And, um, <clears throat> I'll talk more about deconvolution uh, uh, both in this class and in 757. Is the Fourier conjugate always the same as the complex conjugate? Is that just another name? Yeah, well, what you can see here is is the uh, um, the the complex conjugate is really the same thing whether we're talking about z being in terms of omega or z just being z. You know, it's really it's really uh, when you start adding these up at some constant omega, that's where you're actually doing the Fourier transform. All right, so. Let's uh, let's finally grapple with these issues of uh, you know how do we sample frequency and and how do we how do we you know the z transform you know using z of omega I mean that just that just uh, really just uses uh, 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 that that gives us a, a continuous um, uh, you know in the con that gives us a Fourier transform in the continuous omega domain now let's let's look at sampling the omega domain. And what we can do with that. So this is called the you know we had the FT. That's the continuous Fourier transform. This is the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT. The DFT goes from sampled data in time to sampled um, data in frequency. Okay, sampled Fourier transform data in the frequency domain. Uh, so here's a, a, an expression. You know, at, at continuous frequency, okay. Um, so uh, uh, what we have is the Fourier transform of x with, uh, at this frequency omega is equal to the sum from uh, uh, n equals zero to the number of samples minus one. Notice that I'm using indexing like C in Java instead of indexing like Fortran. Right? Fortran indexing starts at the first element is one. The last element is n, capital N. And here we're using uh, uh, in C and Java. Uh, I don't know about Python. Indexing um, um, starts at zero. The first element has index zero, and the final element in the series has an index equal to the number of samples, capital N minus one. Okay, so that's uh, that's just a that's just my my C Java bias here. Um, 
So we have uh, we take x at at uh, sample index n. Uh, so it's a time it's a discrete time series already sampled a time series. Uh, we multiply it by the and then we multiply it by the uh, the Fourier uh, exponential. Okay, which is e to the i times omega times n. That's not omega sub n. That's omega times n times delta t. Okay, and and we also know that this is now. Uh, you know, this is the sum over times n of x sub n uh, times z to the nth power. You know, given that Fourier definition of, of z. All right. So you know, n times delta t. That's the continuous time. Okay. That that sample that that sample of x is at. Um, but this is still continuous omega here. Um, now I, I've also explained to you how this Fourier Exponential is, you know, any value of this, whatever we put in the in this imaginary expo exponent, it's going to be going around the unit circle. Okay, so whatever you know, whatever omega times n times delta t is, it's going to be somewhere around the unit circle. Okay, and, and the uh, uh, you know where it appears is a frequency. You know the the angle here from the real z-axis up to you know whatever value we have here in the exponent, okay, that's a frequency omega, okay. Um, so we want to sample we want to sample at discrete frequency points in omega, okay. Now now first let's talk about what is our range of omega, all right. Um, so so first of all. Um, uh, we want to start at zero frequency, okay, and we want to sample up, you know, one times around the circle, one time around the principal fold, as it's called, okay. And, and what frequency is that uh, that we that we that we sample up to? Well, if you remember the discussion of uh, of the Nyquist frequency, right? Um, our range. Is up to two pi over delta t. That's one time around the unit circle, right? So you you put in two pi over delta t in as omega, and that gives you, um, uh, you know that that cancels the delta t here, and um, and it gives you two pi, right? So that would be back around to the real to the real axis, okay? So with if we want capital N frequency samples, then our our sample interval, our frequency sample interval delta omega, is two pi over n over delta t. Okay, two pi over n times delta t. So now let's let's uh, let's write it out. Right, uh, I'm going to use J for the frequency index. I'm using n. For the time index, okay, so we have a sum, right? Uh, um, x at continuous frequency j times delta omega, uh, which I'll just denote as x sub j, right? And and uh, you know we might even we might even uh, uh, at some point drop the delta omega and and just call it x sub j, right? Um, or assume that delta omega is one, you know, just for algebraic simplicity. Uh, but but here's where it actually goes in, okay. And uh, uh, so you know we have delta omega times j, so we have e to the i times this you know delta omega two pi over n delta t times j the the frequency index times n times delta t right n is the time index times delta t gives you the continuous time, okay. So now the discrete Fourier transform. Um, is uh, it gives us you know n components, right? N components at uh, um, uh, uh, at uh, uh, in, in frequency. Okay, so x at uh, in frequency index j is equal to uh, uh, a summation, right? This is one complex number, and it's equal to a, a, a sum. Uh, of of all the times of x at all times 
times this Fourier discrete Fourier uh, exponential e to the i 2 pi over the number of frequency samples big N times j times n. Okay, and and this is uh, you know as you might expect n squared operations. Okay, um, we can write down you know by inspection. We can write down the inverse discrete Fourier transform, right? What we get is x at time index little n, and it's uh, again we're going to uh, just like the forward Fourier transform, we're going to apply the whole. Um, uh, you know, this is what Clairbaut does. He he for simplicity again, he applies the whole scale factor in the inverse, and no, he applies no scale factor in the forward transform. Okay. Now, obviously, when we do it in the computer, you know, we want to see real amplitudes. So we apply uh, what would our scale factor be? It would be one over square root of n. Okay, so we actually, you know, like my codes that do the Fourier transform, actually apply uh, that scale factor. Okay, and it depends on how long the time, the how many frequency samples there are, right? Okay, so it's uh, uh, um, one over. Uh, uh, okay, so so in the inverse, it's one over n. You know, according to Clairbaut, we're summing over all the frequencies j. Okay. Uh, oh, there is another tricky thing here. Notice, notice that I've assumed there's going to be the same number of frequency samples as time samples. This is the same big N here. Okay. So whether I'm counting frequencies j or time samples uh, n, little n, I'm counting up to big N. Okay. Now I hope that makes sense to everybody. I I I'm, I'm not going to go and prove it at least yet. Um, why uh, uh, you know just in, in terms of information theory, uh, it ought to make sense to you that um, that when we do a Fourier transform. The most appropriate way to do it is to have the same number of samples in the Fourier transform as we have in the original time series. Okay, and they're going to be distributed. You know, those n samples are going to be distributed around the unit circle this way, in in z space, uh, in z space. Okay, and so you know, to do the inverse transform, we sum over all the frequency components, and um, we're summing x sub j e to the i minus i. 2 pi over big N times J times N. Um, notice that, that there's, there's two kind of spectacular things about this. Okay? Uh, delta T does not appear. The only thing that's important here is N. Delta T does not appear. Um, so we don't need to know delta T to do a, Fourier, a discrete Fourier transform. It's you know it's it's irrelevant. We don't need to do we don't need to do um, uh, we don't need to know delta x to do a discrete spatial Fourier transform. It's irrelevant. Okay, that's kind of surprising. Um, you know, of course, if we're actually computing what our Nyquist frequency is, then we need to know delta t. But just to do the transform, we don't need to know delta t. Or delta x. Okay, uh, it's you know either way it's n squared operations, right? You got to do you do all the summations, you know. So so if we have you know uh, capital N time samples, we got to do this summation over capital N frequencies, uh, capital N times. So it's n squared operations. All right, same as a uh, as a cross correlation. I mean, as you can see, the the uh, um, the uh, uh, the Fourier transform really is a cross correlation between uh, the data and the Fourier uh, the Fourier exponentials. Okay, uh, let me uh, just demonstrate the uh, inverse here, and we'll see a, an easier way of expressing this uh, instead of summations. Okay, uh, here's a simple time series um, x sub n. Has a component at zero time x zero x one x two x three. Okay, it's just a you know here's a four element vector. It's got a four term z transform polynomial, right? Um, 
and and you know if we substitute in the omega definition of z, then it would be x of omega, x zero plus x one times z plus x two times z squared plus x three times z to the third power. Okay. Now now let me let me uh, let me uh, take the the z's right, which we know now know are e to the i two pi over n. Okay, that's how many. You know that's that's the delta omega. Okay. Uh, and it's also w is equal to e to the i omega zero, right? This omega zero is 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 kind of the delta omega, e to the, you know two pi over n, but uh, actually the uh, uh, the delta t is not in here. Okay, so it's not quite the same uh, as the definition of uh, of the uh, uh, the Fourier definition of z. Okay, so uh, 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 you know, same, same, same W here. So our, our discrete Fourier transform, um, you know, here's the forward transform. Uh, x at frequency j is equal to a sum over times index indices from zero to n minus one of x at index n times this W to the power of n times j. Okay. W to the power of n times j, and that you know <clears throat> that will accomplish this this series this series. Now, the summation it might look familiar as a matrix multiplication. Okay, so here we have a column vector of the input time series, right? And it's it's got four uh, time samples, so the column vector is four four elements high x0, x1, x2, x3. Our output is a column vector of the frequency sa uh, samples of the Fourier transform, capital X0, capital X1, capital X2, capital X3. Okay, those are the these x's are the, are the complex numbers, which are the, um, <clears throat> which are the uh, Fourier transforms. And then uh, uh, the w, notice, you know, w to the power of j times n, right? So you can make. Uh, let's see, what do we do here? Uh, j is the row number, and n is the column index. Okay, so um, uh, you know, for um, when uh, uh, um, you know, you take this uh, this column vector, and you uh, you transpose it and lay it on top of the uh, the row, okay? That you're multiplying by. You take the dot product, right? So that would be x zero times one, which is of course w to the power of zero of j equals zero times n, right? So since j equals zero on this uh, on this row, this first row up here, uh, then all the w's are always one, okay? So it's x zero. Times one plus x one plus x two plus x three, and that equals big X at frequency at frequency element zero. Okay, um, and we're going to do a fair amount of this uh, of this matrix multiplication. So, you know, um, uh, you know, look up uh, look up matrix multiplication and just imagine doing it. All right, or or write it out. You know, write these terms out what they actually are. You know, which is basically just saying exactly the same thing as writing out this summation. You know, so so you know the the x three term uh, uh, at frequency index three is the dot product of this column this uh, column vector um, uh, with uh, the last row the the bottom row. You know, so it's x zero times one times x one plus x one times uh, w three plus x two times w to the sixth power plus x three times w to the ninth power. Okay, and you can see how you know the exponent on w here is the the row number times the column number. Okay, and that's why that's uh, 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 here's another reason why I, I like using the c notation because we do need to use you know we do need to have exponents zero in these uh, first column and the first row. Okay. So uh, let's see. Now W is a complex number, right? Uh, and it's just you know, 
uh, it's, it's got magnitude 1. It's just somewhere around the unit circle, right? Because uh, it's an imaginary ex exponential. Okay, so it's, uh, it's an unscaled complex number. Um, let's see, and, and here you know you have big N times T there, and you have big N times omega there. And uh, turns out, it, right, since the magnitude of, of all of these W's is 1, you know, w to the nine millionth power, uh, nine millionth and first power is is still has magnitude one. It's still on that, it's still on the unit circle. It's just, you know, we just spun, you know, uh, 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 very close to, down to uh, two pi there, um, and uh, uh, so it's uh, still, uh, you know, still magnitude one. So actually, this this matrix you can invert it by inspection. Notice it's also uh, symmetric. It's a symmetric matrix across the diagonal of the matrix, um, so you know very easy to uh, to invert, um, and it's just you know ones again on the uh, uh, on the top row and the left column, and then notice here you just take the uh, 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 it's it's uh, exactly the complex conjugate, right? Uh, w to the ninth power has a complex conjugate W to the minus ninth power, um, and that is really uh, 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 really easy to uh, uh, to see. Uh, notice where the uh, the scale factors are. Okay, um, so uh, uh, here we have a uh, uh, you know, this is another reason you know, we made this square matrix because we wanted uh, to have the same number of samples in frequency as we do in time. Okay, and this is—I'm sorry, this is not n times omega. This is n sub omega number of frequency samples. Okay, and that's not multiplied there at all. So that's just—that's just saying this column vector is the number of frequency samples high. The column vector over here on the right is the number of time samples high. Um, and so we invert—you know—we just have one over n. Uh, as the scale there on the on the inverse uh, uh, on the inverse uh, DFT, okay. So very simple. You know we have u is the you know we have column vector x, column vector uh, x uh, Fourier transform of x. We have uh, the this matrix of w's which we'll call u, and I put the two squiggles under it to mean it's a matrix, and uh, which I'll eventually drop the two squiggles. And u inverse, which is defined right here, is the um, uh, is the inverse of the matrix and the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so in this notation, okay, you know why do we go to this uh, matrix notation? Well, really, just to try to make it simpler. All right, so um, uh, I'll explain this more and the implications of this more. Um, and we'll see why it's uh, um, you know. Why is this matrix so easily invertible? We'll see why.